Now calling to order the April 28th, 2022 meeting of the Mashpee Conservation Commission. Before we begin, if everyone could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we get going, as a distinguished member of our commission here who will be uh, departing his service to our commission after how many years, Brad? I don't really know. Probably 12, 14, something like that. After a long time, he's been a great friend to Mashpee conservation efforts. He's been an excellent steward for our conservation lands, and speaking from experience, he's an excellent mentor. We, I, sp I think I speak for the whole commission and the community when I say thank you, Brad. I just want to make sure that somebody is ready for the motions. <laughs> <laughs> With all the conditions. Yes, yes. That will that's be, a tough, that's, that's a yeah, that Someone needs to step up to the plate there. <laughs> when it came to motions, if you're familiar with our meetings, uh, Brad was our star pitcher. <laughs> Our ace, staff ace. Somebody <laughs> had to do it. <laughs> all right. And I, I'd just like to thank, thank you, Brad, for all your years of service. And, and I know you, this is just one of many areas that you volunteer your time and effort towards. And I just want to know how much uh, it's appreciated by myself and the staff and, and all of your fellow commissioners. Uh, so thank you very much for all your years of service. I miss, I miss Caitlin here tonight. I know, I know. Well, if you want to come back on May, May 12th, she'll be here. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can pop into the office, too. That'll be your last week is uh, the week of May 13th. I think I may have heard the next step, so I'll make my leave right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Before we uh, begin, is there anyone in the audience who has business before this commission that is not on the agenda? All right. Seeing none, we'll proceed with the pre and post items. Drew? Sure. So the first item up. Uh, is it a request for administrative approval? And this is for uh, 18 Spoon Drift Circle, DEP file number 43 3094. Is anyone here in the audience to represent 18 Spoon Drift? Yeah. Eric Rothenberg. Oh, Eric, are you representing? Is someone from Falmouth Engineering speaking also? or? No, they're not coming tonight, just me. Okay. All right. I will bring up the slide here and I've got some photos as well but if you want to we're just passing out the plans now to the commissioners and um, I'm gonna put the plan up here and just want to give your name for the record and then a description of what you're requesting so this is Eric Rothenberg I'm the one of the two owners of the property <laughs> the Original approval about, I don't know, a year ago uh, was for the stairs to come down to a raised patio, and the raised patio was three steps up above the grade, and the change was to make the stairs, instead of having them land on the top of a three-step up patio, to just land on a landing, which is right where Drew's circling. Um, that's essentially three steps up from the patio. The patio is now at grade. And the previous patio is the dotted line uh, below the patio. And the new plan is the curve that comes off the edge of the house and curves around. Um, and the so we're giving up the triangle next to the rinse station there and gaining a little more square footage on the patio. The patio does not exceed uh, the coastal bank any further, and the red line below that is the the old decking of the house that existed before it was torn down. So you can see the, the point at the end of the landing uh, is the furthest point that the old house extended, and uh, there's the minimus changes uh, with the new plan to have it at grade. There's an 18-inch 18 18 inch oak tree just off the patio that was 
saved uh, during construction. And that tree um, we, we, uh, is not going to be impacted at all by the change in the patio. The patio is going to sit uh, above all the roots of the tree and not disturb anything on the tree. Um, and so we feel that it's just a, a slight change in the plans, but no real square footage change, material change. Um, and it just makes for a better layout than to have three steps up all the way around. So the old patio, which is, again, the dotted line, that was three steps up from the grade. So you would step up everywhere along that dotted line was three steps up. And we decided that was cumbersome and just wanted the patio at grade and only have a landing that would go three steps up. The patio is just a bluestone patio with uh, sand in between and so forth, so drainage is still the same. show some photos of the site. Yeah, do you have any further comments? So, um, Eric, just going back to the plan here, is, there was, is this additional mitigation that was proposed or was this part of the original plan? These, That's the original uh, mitigation. We were about four times the mitigation requirement right. in the original. I think it probably is still up in the right corner of the plan. Um, Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you look there, um, we're restoring, I think it might be below that, the, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the mitigation calculations are right below that. Okay. I, I can't see them, but I know that we are really well, at, at least double, if not quadruple, required minimum yeah, I think uh, the, mitigation the, plantings. And, like uh, and so that we didn't change any of that, so that all that work is still going to be done. Okay. So just to show, uh, Commissioner, some photos of the site. This is the uh, this is the lot 18 Spoon Drift. The house, as you'll see in the photos that I'll show, is currently under construction. So this was issued in order conditions for uh, demolition of the existing home and construction of new single family home with associated appurtenances. So this is the uh, top left is a view of the house from the street, new house under construction. This is the patio area. So Eric, is this, this is to be removed, this edging for the expansion, is that correct? No, that's the actual patio. So if you look at the picture. So is it already, um, is it already finished? Not finished, it's just soil in the middle. No, I mean, I mean the, the, pro the proposed expansion. That's the, that's the whole thing has expanded, okay. and the tree when we dug out for the for the footings, uh, there were no we didn't even encounter a single branch okay. from the tree the oak tree on the right there. Okay. Uh, yeah, that that we didn't even have to, not even one, and we took pictures in case you were worried because we didn't even hit a single root. Okay. It's uh, the tree went straight down, okay. and so there was no impact whatsoever. Um, I, I mean, well, the contractor had pictures of everything. Okay. And so that will be filled back in, backfilled in to the cinder block will support the bluestone patio. Okay. So it's, it's a cinder block height. I mean, a, a, a bluestone paver height above those cinder blocks. Okay. Would be, and the rest would be a great, but you can see it's still about an inch or two below where the tree mm -hmm. goes into grade. And it will slope down slightly a few inches. That's it. Okay. The reason I had asked is because when I was discussing with Falmouth Engineering, I had assumed the work hadn't taken place yet because it was being requested before the commission. And then when I went out and saw the patio and I measured, I figured it had taken place yet. So that was just a, I wasn't aware that the work had already taken place. Um, yeah, they went way. I just drove down from Needham today. Uh, I was meant to come live to the hearing, but we got here too late. So uh, I was surprised that how fast they had done everything. But okay. obviously, nothing is set in stone that we couldn't remove it if you guys felt it was uh, not in play. But they, this is the the reason for the rush was because this landing where the machine is, the compacting machine, that's the landing for the exit staircase for the deck. Okay. That's where it lands. Right. So they couldn't. We 
we've had the deck up for a few months now, and we haven't been able to build the front the front steps or the rear steps uh, until there's a platform for it to land on. Okay. Um, I, I don't think it's a big deal. I would just say for future reference, if you run up against something that's time sensitive, just contact us first before the work takes place because uh, you as the applicant are responsible for how the construction takes place. So if, if things are being expanded or need to be changed and it's time sensitive or, or what have you, um, the order conditions requires you to let us know before the changes take place. Um, as I said, it's not something that I feel was, you know, egregious in the situation or that it caused any harm. It's just I wasn't aware of it. Uh, there was no communication that the work had actually taken place. So I was under the assumption I was going out there looking at something that hadn't been done yet. But, um, again, it's not, not a huge deal. But just, just for future reference, um, just a couple of other things that I noted. The machine here, the heavy machinery, is actually out beyond the work limit. So that needs to be brought back in. You can tell your contractors that, or if they need to bump out the work limit again, you know, communicate that to us, and we can, we can take a look and see if the work limit needs to be expanded. But the orders state that no heavy machinery or materials can go beyond the work limit, and that machine is beyond the work limit. So we need to get that back inside. This is the work limit here. You can see in this photo, it's, it's outside the fence. Again, not causing an issue, but just something that's in the orders. And, you know, if there's any change in the work limit or it needs to be removed or anything like that, you got to communicate that to us um, before that happens. So, again, just another picture here, bottom left. This is the uh, completed patio. This is the retaining wall. Um, looks like a planter bed or something like that here. Or No, no, that's, that's now... Uh, bluestoned already. That's the landing. So the, oh, the, the landing. ledger board Got up, Got up right yeah. is okay. where the staircase will begin. Got it. And that's where it'll come down to that spot. Okay. And this is the uh, this is the backyard area. So this is where the mitigation plantings will go. Going back to the exactly. going back to the plan. This area here. This is this is what will be planted up as part of the original order of conditions. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, my biggest concern, just when this was initially presented, was that this 18-inch oak wasn't going to be impacted from the excavation, and the excavation was pretty minor, uh, as you can see from the photos, and they did not encounter any roots. I didn't see any root systems in the excavated area out here, just outside of the. Um, edge of the patio, so this tree was not impacted, and that was really my biggest concern with uh, with the patio work. And, and the original plan said raised patio, which would have meant more excavation, but it turned out to be an at grade. So, um, no other comments. I would recommend an approval of the administrative request. Thank you, Drew. Questions and comments from the commissioners. Is there anyone in the audience who's here to discuss this proposal? If there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion for administrative approval. I would move to approve the uh, project and application at 18 Spoonbill Circle with the uh, cooperation of the uh, Conservation Department on mitigation planning. All right. If there's no further discussion, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Voting. Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Eric. Jump in. Take care, Drew. Yeah, we we'll just wait till she. Stacy goes around and collects up the plants and distribute new ones. Thank you. Now calling the 6 o'clock hearing from Michael J. and Jennifer G. Skokler. 
220 Waddling Place Road, 228 Waddling Place Road. Proposed construction of elevated boardwalk and mitigation plantings. The representative is BSC Group. This is an NOI. Paul, can you hear us? Yep, can you hear me? I can, we can hear you. Perfect. All right, um, yep, my name is Paul Mancuso. I am here um, from the BSC Group presenting a project at 220 and 228 Waiting Place Road. Um, so the proposed project is um, an elevated boardwalk to access the existing shared pier ramp and float system. So um, there, there is an existing pier ramp and float that is shared between 220 and 228 Waiting Place Road right there. And so for both homeowners to access their shared pier from 220 Waiting Place Road on the left side here, they would have to walk um, through their backyard over a coastal dune through a salt marsh to access their, their pier. And the neighbor um, has to walk over a coastal dune to access the existing pier. So the purpose of this project is to eliminate the need for them to walk through, through the dune, through the marsh to access their pier. So essentially the, the project would be to build an elevated um, boardwalk so that both um, homeowners can access the pier um, without going through those resource areas and causing foot, track, foot traffic through the um, coastal dune and salt marsh. Um, and the, the plan is, um, only really shows the 220 waiting place road. Um, we've done prior work for them, so we have a full survey of their property. But um, also because all of the mitigation proposed is on 220 Waiting Place Road on the left side of the screen there. And so um, our engineers use the MASHP mitigation planting calculation sheet um, based on the resource areas we're working in, which is um, coastal dune and salt marsh. We are also in the buffer zone to coastal bank, sort of along the west side of the property on 228, I mean, on 220 Waiting Place Road is a coastal bank. So we're within the buffer zone to that. Um, and so we calculated that for this boardwalk, we would need to provide 1,773 square feet of mitigation, and we're providing, um, I believe, just over 2,000 square feet. And so on this sheet, you can see the areas where we are providing mitigation. Um, the striped hash pattern right there, yep, at, that's sort of on the seaward edge of the lawn. They're going to plant that area, 325 square feet, with American beach grass, um, sort of as a buffer to the dune and salt marsh. And then on the left side of the property, um, these areas are already vegetated, but there are some invasives in there, um, specifically bittersweet vine. I believe there's some uh, Moro's honeysuckle and um, maybe some seaside rose in there. We are proposing to treat the invasives with glycophate. And um, in these areas, that, that might leave some, once we treat it and remove the invasives, that's going to leave some open areas. So on the next sheet of the plan, which we don't need to go to yet, we have a planting plan showing what we are proposing to plant in those areas. Um, that's a 386 square foot area and a 400 square foot area. And then on the right side of the property, we have another 962 square foot area where we are proposing to remove um, invasives. That area has a bunch of mature trees, um, cedar trees in there. So we're not proposing to plant in there. We're just proposing to remove the invasive vines, which are starting to choke out the trees there. So um, please go to the second sheet on the plan, Drew, please. Sure. Yeah, so here we have a uh, planting table on the top left, but also in those hashed areas on the left side of the plan, it details what we'll be planting. So we're going to be planting um, some sweet pepper bush or um, um, summer sweet, as it's called, northern bayberry and Virginia rose in the open areas that um, result from removing the invasives. But that's about it. It's just the elevated boardwalk, which will be um, constructed with flow-through decking. It will be constructed at a um, 1.5 to 1 height-to-width ratio, as is recommended by uh, DEP's guidelines for um, piers. Um, so it should not impact the vegetation below. Um, it should allow um, plenty of sunlight to pass through so that nothing's really impacted except where the pilings are installed. And that's about it. Um, I guess at this point, if the commission has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Drew, comments? So, Paul, I was just trying to look for the uh, natural heritage comments. Was there, this was just natural heritage, right? Can you just touch on that? 
Yeah, Thank so um, 220 Waiting Place Road is not in uh, natural heritage priority habitat. However, there's a small section down there on the beach where the boardwalk uh, boardwalk is proposed to access from 228 that is in natural heritage priority habitat. We've submitted the um, notice of intent and plans to them. We have not heard back, um, but if they offer any comments or suggestions, we'll definitely include or be cognizant of what they have to say, but we have not heard back from, the, from them at this point. Yeah, I think this was for the, um, just give one second here, Paul, I'm just looking at a letter. I can follow up with natural heritage in this letter. I'm not sure if this was for, it must have been for this one, a time of year restriction, April 1st to August 31st um, for construction of the boardwalk yep. just because of piping plover um, yep. nesting season. So construction or installation associated with the proposed project shall not occur during the period of April 1st to August 31st to protect state listed species. So we'll We'll take that condition and incorporate it into the local order should the commission approve the project. Um, just to show the commissioners some photos of the site. So this is actually really uh, improving a condition where it's currently just foot traffic. That's, it's a shared dock between the two properties. This is the, uh, this is the beginning of the fixed pier here where you've just got kind of an at grade ramp up to the stairway, uh, up to the fixed pier, <clears throat> coastal bank dune area here. Um, and then looking at this stake uh, here, this is the upland looking at the backyard out towards the dock. This is where the proposed boardwalk is going to be to provide access through the coastal dune uh, to get access to the existing fixed pier. So uh, it's certainly a better situation than now, which is just foot traffic. It will help to accommodate access from both properties and with the through flow decking won't uh, should shouldn't have any impact on the vegetation allow vegetation to grow underneath um, mitigation as you uh, as Paul had described uh, in the combination of planting native seagrass dune grass rather and um, and then eradication of invasive species and supplementing with uh, with native material so project meets the performance standards for coastal Dune, land subject to coastal storm flow. Um, I think the boardwalk, you revised it to three and a half feet in width, Paul. Is that? Yeah. Yep. yep. So it's actually under the uh, max width uh, restriction under our regulation 27 docks and piers, um, which is four feet. So they've minimized it as best they can while trying to provide safe access uh, through the dune and then up and over uh, salt marsh connecting to the existing pier. So overall, a better situation than what currently exists. And um, I recommend to close an issue with the condition of uh, three-year monitoring and maintenance of all mitigation plantings. Thank you, Drew. Questions and comments from our commissioners? Uh, yes, Drew, could you give me those dates again that they are restricted from uh, working on this project? Doug? Yep. So it's April 1st to August 31st, yeah. right? April, April 1st to August 31st are the uh, restricted dates. That's the restricted date range to not interfere with uh, shorebird, nesting, shorebird nesting season. So not a lot for many work during that time? Correct. Okay. Other questions and comments from the commissioners? Hearing none, is there anyone in the audience who has anything to say about this hearing? There's no further discussion. We'll entertain a motion. This is an NOI. Uh, I would make a motion to uh, approve, close an issue for the conditions of no uh, work performed between April 1st and August 31st. Also, condition of pre-year monitoring. Thank you, Charlie. There's no other discussion. We'll hear a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Now voting. Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you.
Thank you, Paul. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Mm -hmm. Now calling the 603 hearing for Francis Gloria Muir, Life Estate, 31 Wilson's Grove, proposed septic system upgrade. Representative is Shea Environmental. This is an RDA. Hi, I'm Carmen Shea from Shea Environmental Services, and I'm here representing the folks at 31 Wilson's Grove. Basically, we have a septic system upgrade, and uh, that upgrade is within an A flood zone and also within uh, the 100 feet of a coastal bank. It's about 96 and a half feet from the top of bank. Uh, Carmen, sorry, because we have a hybrid meeting, can you pull the mic as close to, as, as you can and just uh, oh. speak loud? Because okay. the is, commissioners is who are mic? attending remotely is, yeah. Is this it's on. on? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, do you want me to repeat or? Please. So I'm here representing uh, 31 Wilson's Grove. We have a septic system upgrade that is within an AE flood zone and also uh, within 100 feet of coastal bank, approximately 96 and a half feet from the bank. And um, what we're proposing is a new, uh, well, the reason for the upgrade is that the existing system uh, does not comply with the Mashpee Board of Health bylaw regarding uh, separation to groundwater. So failed the Title V inspection. And uh, we're proposing a 2,000 gallon tank that is a two compartment with 1,500 gallon tank, 500 gallon pump chamber. And we're then proposing a uh, raised system that uh, has a lock and block uh, retaining wall that's that then puts the system, you know, above the groundwater table. This is all actually gone through the Board of Health last week, so that's been approved. And um, so basically we're just looking to get your approval so that we can repair the septic system there. Thank you. Drew, comments? So just to show the commissioner some photos of the site. This is a site that's, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with Wilson's Grove, you've got a lot of tightly packed residences. So there's not a lot of, <clears throat> or much of any uh, natural vegetation in this area, the flood zone. Um, sorry, maybe I didn't put any photos in. Well, I apologize for that. But you can kind of see just from uh, this aerial that this is all entirely pre-disturbed. Uh, just going to the plan to show where the Work is taking place, the septic work is in the rear of the home, so there's an existing shed there that would have to be removed um, in order to accommodate the work, but there is no disturbance or removal of native vegetation. Um, Board of Health comments, property is in a zone two and is restricted to existing two bedrooms with a conventional system. Septic system design approved by Board of Health with some revisions and they did have to receive some variances Permit is pending receipt of a revised plan, but has that already been received? It hasn't. I was waiting okay. for any comments here. Got but it. Basically, the revisions are that they allowed us a one-foot um, reduction. We we had based our uh, groundwater separation uh, using Frimter, so we were, uh, you know, basically one point one point two feet additionally above groundwater than what was observed. And then we had a, the neighbors were a little bit, you know, a little bit upset about the fact that they didn't want runoff onto their properties because of the retaining wall. The Board of Health, uh, you know, I requested if they could give us the one foot reduction and we still would be above the observed groundwater table, all felt accept, that was acceptable and that we were still protecting, you know, public health and the environment and still making the neighbors a little bit happier that there wouldn't be perhaps runoff onto, you know, you see how tight these properties are. It's, you yeah, know, ridiculous. Sure, really. 
So, and, and they're already complaining about the folks behind them, which have a, a significantly elevated property. And, you know, the water just apparently is running onto their property. So, of course, anything additional just stirred the pot. It was a very fun hearing. <laughs> True comments? Sorry. This, I do have pictures. They were just in the wrong place. Uh, so here, top left, this is the street side view of the home, uh, existing driveway. <coughs> Bottom left, just showing back side, rear side of the home, looking out towards the road. And this is the area uh, where you've got the uh, septic system um, repair work proposed. And you can kind of see back here, there's a retaining wall, and the property behind, as you would describe, is, is at a higher elevation. Um, behind here, so uh, no other comments. And we do have Board of Health printed out with the uh, variances that were granted. Um, if anybody wants to see that. Thank you, Drew. Questions and comments from our commissioners? Uh, yeah, I have one quick question Mr. Uh, for the applicant. The, uh, the retaining walls on three sides is the fourth side, the grade at 11.25 there on the Yes, because it slopes up at the back, so we're not going to require a wall on that. Uh, the, if you went beyond the property, it just keeps going up. Okay. So so, it's, so essentially so we're... It's going to come down and level off at the, yeah, at the top of the wall. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. And now with the reduction uh, that we were given by the Board of Health, it's, it's going to be even a little better. There was one photo that showed the abutter. He has a little bit of a raised area where his system is, if you look across where the shed is. So if you see that lawn area across the little patio, that's actually about where we're going to end up grade-wise now that we have our one-foot reduction. So it made him very happy. You know, the neighbor next door won't really be as impacted, uh, so it made them happier. And uh, we've, we've got nothing but grade going up from there. So the, the, uh, so the, the wall that's going to be up against the house, so is that elevation 8 right in that patio that's right on that photograph? And yes. And then you're going to be another three feet above for the top of the wall? Yeah, actually two now because we're one foot reduced from my original plan. Okay. So is that is the wall going to go up against the back of the house? Or? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> There's no foundation under this house. It's literally on cement blocks. So we have no other choice. It's not as if we can finagle something to, to make it work. It's, it's, this is it. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Other questions and comments from the commissioners? Yes. Mr. Secretary. Um, traditionally, I ask this question on most septic system upgrades. Uh, why not an IA proposal? Well, we have a 25 by 90 lot, which mostly is occupied by the house. I don't think I could even fit another component on there without. So the way I designed this, the, the neighbor's house, is fortunately set a bit more forward and does not extend as far to the rear of the property as this particular house and other houses in that area. If I were to have to squeeze one more tank on this property, we would be in danger of, we're only two feet from the lot line and his house is maybe another foot. Mm -hmm. So I set everything as far back as possible and that's why we didn't do anything L-shaped or, or occupy any of the rest of the driveway with the septic system was because we would, we literally just even to put this tank in are gonna have to have a trench box and sheathing and everything. The house itself not being on a foundation is also gonna have to have piers poured under it before we even can dig for the septic system for fear of that collapsing in. So it's a pretty tricky project as is. It's a two-bedroom home. It's not on a foundation. Why a 2,000-gallon tank for a two-bedroom home? Oh, because 1,500 is the standard size for a septic tank for mm -hmm. Title V, yeah. and then the second compartment is 500 gallons for the pump chamber. So it's just that rather than trying to squeeze, you know, put two separate tanks as we just discussed yeah. um, and, and increase the length of what we have to dig, one tank made more sense to just dig it, drop it, and you know, move on. Yeah. You know, the tank itself is H20 so that all machinery can actually run over 
the tank one set without impacting it. You know, so it can take vehicular traffic and machinery traffic. And we have such a limited area to work in that, you know, literally you're gonna have a machine and then a dump truck and they're gonna spin and drop and, and have to take everything off site as it goes. So it's, it's very, I'm glad I'm not digging this one. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I do excavation work as well. I, I wish I weren't looking at it. Um, I asked our agent to put these two photographs up. Uh, the one on the left is from Google Maps, which shows the location of 31 uh, Grove. The one on the right is the FEMA uh, ArcGIS for this area. <coughs> you can see three shaded areas. There's a purplish area, a red area, and a yellow. This particular project is in that yellow area. And this is the high case scenario for coastal erosion 2030. That's eight years away. So when I see a septic tank that's not going to meet the five foot separation. You're referring to the leaching component. The, yes. When I see that reduced, and I know the ocean is coming up, and I know the groundwater is coming up, I have a real hard time saying that this is a viable presentation. I have a feeling if all that's true that none of these homes are probably going to be very viable. We do have a major problem. I, I can't believe there's been naysayers about climate change. You know, I was teaching climate change almost 30 years ago. Of course, I was crazy at that point. But it's here. And as we look at new proposals, rebuilds, new homes, it has to be taken into consideration. Now, there's disclaimers with all of this. You know, it's kind of like forecasting the weather, you know. Well, it's going to snow tomorrow, and, you know, it's 80 degrees. But we have seen changes. I've seen changes in the short time that I've lived in Mashpee, six years. And I can see a major shift in what's going on along the coastline. So when I see a proposal like this that is that close, and then I overlay this ArcGIS program, I get pretty nervous. So I, I'm not thoroughly convinced that it's a good idea to try to reduce separation from groundwater, because when that groundwater comes up, it might not be a one-to-one -one ratio for the elevation and sea level. There's a lot of variables that go into it. Sea level may go up a half a foot, and groundwater could go up an inch. It could go right. up five feet. We don't know. So those are my concerns. And I, the reason I wanted the photographs was not so much for the client, but for the commission. I don't know if you've looked at this program. Drew sent it out to us six months ago. And I look at it every time there's a presentation, I pull this up and I look to see how does it play out with what's possibly coming our way. And this one doesn't play out very well at all for any of those properties. I'm not concerned about the purple area. I'd, I'd be 150 years old. That's probably not going to happen. But I am concerned about the yellow. That's eight years away, if they're correct. Hopefully they're not. But, you know, those are my concerns with the project. Thank you, Paul. Other commissioners? Anyone in the audience who would like to make comment on this hearing? There's no further discussion. We'll entertain a motion. This is an RDA. On the application of 31 Wilson Grove, I move to make a negative determination. Thank you, Charlie. If there's no further discussion, we'll hear a second. I'll second that. Thank you, Tom. Now voting. Paul? No. Brian? No. Tom? Aye. Charlie? Yes. Alex? Yes. I vote no. What is it? Is that uh, That, that was three no's. Vote. Three no's, three yes. Yep. So the motion, uh, when it comes to RDAs, um, there's a motion there should be a motion. If an RDA is not approved by the commission, the motion should be for a positive determination. 
uh, which means that the commission, uh, well, I would I would recommend that you put forth, you know, an associated reason for a positive determination, um, which essentially means that it's not approved under an RDA and it should be submitted as a notice of intent. Um, but because of the type of permit RDA, you have to make that motion for a positive determination if you don't agree with, uh, with the project as proposed. So it's not a denial, it's, mm. it's, a, it's a positive determination. There's only two determinations under an RDA that's positive <coughs> and negative. So. I would encourage a motion for a positive determination from one of the commissioners so that we can move this project forward into a possible notice of intent. Uh, I'll make that uh, motion. Thank you, Tom. If there's no further discussion, we'll hear a second. Second. Thank you, Charlie. Now voting for a positive determination. Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. I, I, I'm trying to understand this. This, this, I mean, we've never done this before. So we're doing this. This was a simple septic upgrade that we've approved many, many times. Mm -hmm. That has a positive impact immediately to the environment. And I'm trying to understand why. Why are we doing a positive determination? A vote for positive determination is. It, it's a it vote, vote for a positive determination means you, you feel that this project uh, is not suitable under a request for determination, that it should be conditioned. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no motion to deny an RDA. There's only either a negative where you are approving as presented or a positive where you're requesting additional information. Uh, so if I vote, or that no. you, you, you feel that this should be conditioned right, uh, so to meet the standards of the right, wetlands. So if I vote no, it means that I approve. I approve this project. If, if you, yeah, if you, if your, if your vote was for a negative determination, yes. it means you are in favor of it as proposed. Yes. Yeah. So now, as this positive, now I'm voting no. It's the same. So if you, I mean, if you voted in favor of this you, previously, yes, uh, I wouldn't think you would be inclined to vote as for a positive determination because that's the opposite of what you. Okay. So I'll voted. be voting no then. Thank you, Tom. If, if you feel that this is suitable as presented, if you have no issues with it. Yeah. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Um, I'm going to vote yes, because I want it to come as a notice of intent. I vote aye as well. Motion carries for positive determination. So at this point, we need to return with an NOI? That's correct. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Now calling the 606 hearing, Janine M. Muir, 62 Quail Hollow Road, proposed septic system upgrade and hardscaping. Representative is Myers and Sons, this is Nardia. Good evening, Darren Meyer, representing the owner. Uh, Jean Massey, 62 Quail Hollow Road. Uh, the proposed project is for an upgrade of a failed septic system. Uh, there is no proposed increase in flow. It'll be a design uh, and an installation of a uh, two-bedroom septic for a two-bedroom dwelling. There's no proposed increase in flow. Uh, we're dealing with uh, a property that's uh, butts John's Pond. Uh, basically, the entire property uh, is within 100 feet of the um, vegetated wetland that was flagged, shown on the plan. Uh, based on Board of Health criteria, nitrogen reduction isn't required unless we're within 75 feet of the um, pond. So we've proposed a two compartment tank just to minimize excavation. We have a limited work area based on the driveway and the water line and some utilities and whatnot. So we have a two compartment tank, 1,500 gallon septic tank required by code, 500 gallon pump chamber to 
pump to an elevated field five feet above adjusted groundwater. Uh, the system is approximately a foot and a half feet out of the ground. We're proposing a timber wall, landscape wall, along the edge of the driveway and the front of the property and a grading out on the left-hand side, uh, natural grade. We have a liner uh, in place to prevent any breakout or anything like that. Um, the wall was necessary. We weren't able to grade all sides because of the proximity to the street and, and the driveway, We're trying to maximize um, you know, setbacks as far away from the wetland as possible. Uh, that's pretty much the project. Uh, we've got mitigation provided, straw bales, work limit line designated on the plan, and i um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Jury comments? This uh, show the commissioners. This is the uh, property here, 62 Quail Hollow, abutting John's Pond. Top left just shows a view of the uh, house from the street. Is this, I'm assuming this pine is probably gonna have to go, is that correct? What's that? The pine tree that you see in this image. Yes. Here, that's that's going. Yeah, right, and so. there's, I think, is it a, it might be a cedar up against the street. That That's yeah. probably gonna be close to. Yeah, it's actually not a native uh, pine, but I just. Yeah, that's, that I think that's gonna, the only tree too there. Okay. So yeah, it's gonna have to go. Okay. Uh, top right, just showing, you've got the bordering vegetative wetland here, backyard. Uh, fringe area bordering John's Pond. Um, just another uh, image of the backyard, so a mix of native vegetation and some landscaping. And then just looking back at the existing home. So this area, top left, this is the area of uh, the leach field. And um, the Board of Health comments said that they're still, plan is still under review, but I did have uh, correspondence with the health agent just to uh, get some more information on what the setbacks were because I saw it was you're keeping it outside the 75 foot that is their mandatory setback so it's being adhered to uh, and I had questioned about you know what the Board of Health thought about uh, an IA system here um, what the agent had pointed out and provided a watershed map is that the flow in this area for watershed that this property and surrounding properties are in uh, the flow goes south so it's not the groundwater direction is not towards the pond, it's away from the pond. Um, so he's just a health agent, just wanted to offer up those comments uh, in lieu of not officially reviewing the plans at this point. Uh, so they are still subject to review. Um, and no other comments. Thank you, Drew. Questions, comments from our commissioners? I have a question. So yes, Mr. The, Secretary. The Board of Health has not finished the review of this? That's, yeah, it's still, well, in talking to Glenn, he said he had pretty much finished the review right. when I talked to him. But we don't have a sign off from them. Don't have a sign off, no. yeah, correct. Yeah. All right. Um, go ahead, Mr. Cook. Darren, how come the uh, retainer wall isn't going around on the uh, west side? Uh, the expense, and we can naturally grade that out without any issue. Okay, even though the. Uh, the, um, don't have enough room to grade it on the east side because of the driveway? Correct. Yeah, and the front would be because of the street. It, you know, it's a two, two or three foot grade and every three feet you're looking at nine feet and it's just total the slope needs to be five feet from the property line and they wanted access with the driveway to keep that there. So you had to keep it in the middle between the driveway and the uh, water line. So it's kind of... Okay. Any, uh, Drew, any concerns with the wall not going all the way around for uh, keeping everything from eroding or? Not really, it's, so. it's a pretty minor grade, so yeah. I think it should be fine. Okay. We can certainly keep an eye on it if, if it you know, necessitates plantings or some more stabilization, but I think it should be all right. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Other questions from our commissioners? Is there anyone in the audience who's come to comment on this hearing? If there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion. This is an RDA. On the application of 62 Quail Hollow Road, I would move for a negative determination. Thank you, Charlie. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Now voting. Paul? No. Brian? Yes. 
Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Now calling the 609 hearing, David M. and Anna S. Ferris, 36 Seconsum Point Road. Proposed dredging and expansion modification of pier ramp and float. Representative from Cape and Islands Engineering, this has been requested to be um, delayed until 6.09 p.m. on May 12th. Uh, just a quick comment. I know this has been, I think, the third continuance request. Um, so there, there has been just a, uh, they're waiting to hear, they, they proposed some minor modifications um, with this one, well, some modifications to the plan and we're wondering to get uh, Shellfish Constable feedback. He hasn't provided feedback yet, so they're, they're looking to see if the proposed changes uh, warrant any different comments from his original comments. Um, so I had, uh, they had asked if it was okay to give a little more time for, for Shellfish feedback on this. Um, same thing for 138 Waterway. So just so the commission is aware of what, why the continuance is being proposed. If there's no questions or comments from the commissioners, we'll entertain a motion for continuance again to 6.09 p.m. on May 12th. I move we continue an issue for David M. and Anna S. Ferris on May 12th, 2022 at 6.09 p.m. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I was mistaken. It's 6.06 .06 p.m. Do you accept that adjustment to your motion? Yes. Thank amended, you. Yeah. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Thank the vice chairman. Beat you, Charlie. <laughs> Voting. Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Do we have a date on this next one? Yep. It's, uh, That's the same. same, yeah, same date and 609. Now calling the 612 hearing, Brian M., Nicole K. Clark, 138 Waterway. Proposed pier extension, ramp relocation, and float expansion. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This has been requested to be delayed until May 12th at 6.09 p.m. Comments and questions? Drew, no? Oh, sorry. Same, uh, same reason. <laughs> Shellfish constable. Uh, giving more time for response to some modifications um, and some communication with the Shellfish constable over those proposals before they uh, proceed with CONCOM. Very good. Questions, comments from the commissioners? All right. Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion for a continuance to May 12th at 6.09 p.m. I'll make a motion to uh, vote to continue the hearing of Brian M. and Nicole Clark, 138 Waterway, to um, 6.09 May, 6 May 12th. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Charlie. Voting, Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now opening the 615 hearing for the town of Mashpee. This is a public comment for proposed prom promulgation of amended chapter 172 Wetland Regulations, 12 Mitigation, and 27 Residential Docks, Piers, and Floats under Mashpee's Chapter 172 Wetland Bylaw. True. Okay. Um, so, as the Commission has been updated in previous meetings as we've gone through the Bylaw Review Subcommittee, we had public comment period already um, advertised in the paper, uh, did not receive any comments from the public on the proposed regulatory language amendments. Uh, so they were then submitted to town council who had some uh, feedback on uh, both regulations, mostly just um, spelling, grammatical, sentence formatting, things like that. 
Um, but uh, nothing of any substantive change for Regulation 12 mitigation. And for Regulation 27, there were a couple of comments that Town Council had that I have since we, we've met this week with the uh, Bylaw Review Subcommittee to address uh, a question Town Council had for the private docks, piers, and floats regulation. And that um, the word dock is used repeatedly throughout the regulation, but doesn't wasn't really defined as what is a dock since the heading is private docks, piers, and floats. So we added language here uh, at the bottom for the purposes of uh, this regulation, the term dock shall be defined as any assemblage of raised fixed pier, floating walkway, ramp, and float. So just because that, that terminology, that term dock is used repeatedly, it says right off in the preface uh, how it's defined. So it isn't just to be taken as a different meaning other than what the regulation uh, centers on in the, uh, in the title. So that was really the only change, um, and there was a question at the uh, at the end here. This section that is a selectman's policy here. This was existing language. Nothing changed here. This was just kept uh, for docks that cross town property. He was town council just wanted to make sure that this was indeed a selectman's policy, and it is. And we just felt it warranted being repeated in this regulation, um, just because it it applies to. Uh, to this regulation, even though it's a, a selectman policy. So it's just uh, repeated under, under the regulation. And there's no, been no changes uh, to the wording there. So, um, so one of the questions I just wanted to put forth, and this is only in regards to this regulation, was and maybe this is just me overthinking things, changing the word private to residential. Um, we can have a discussion on it if you don't think it's worthwhile to do that, if you think private is good. I, it's probably me just overthinking things, um, but uh, I had suggested just changing the word private to residential, just to make it clearer, I guess. How are, pri how are uh, public docs noted in the regulations since I haven't? So pretty much the, the same standards, same but it would be really discretionary for the commission for things like marinas or town landings. Uh, and and the, I, I didn't address those because I didn't want to put a standard on something that could come in any number of different ways for those types of uh, commercial settings uh, or town-owned uh, landings. So I figured it would be just best to, there, I mean, many of the standards in this regulation would apply to those types of projects as well, but it would really be a, just at the discretion of the commission based on how the project is presented by either the town or a private marina. Uh, and there's only two in town, I think. There's Mashpee Neck Marina and then the new Seabury uh, Marina. So, uh, so I didn't add anything. Doesn't mean something couldn't be added in the future. I just felt that it would, should be kind of left open-ended more so. But that many of the standards in, under this, even though it applies to private docks and piers, uh, apply to commercial and town landing settings as well. Okay. Or we could just leave out private entirely or residential and just call it docks, piers, and floats. I think it's important to mark a distinction between commercial operations and, and, and homes. homes. Yeah. Questions, comments on that part? Right. So I, I would ask that the commission, um, you can start with either regulation, but there be a separate motion made for each, okay. for promulgation of each regulation. So we're looking at This would be 27 we just addressed? Yes. <clears throat> if there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion to approve the, the, ch approve the changes to Chapter 172, or Article 27, Residential Docks, Piers, and Floats. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that that we promulgate Chapter 172, Regulation 27, uh, Private Docks, Piers, and Floats, as presented this evening. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Tr Is there any further discussion? Take a second. A second. Thank you, Brian. Now voting. Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. No. 
Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Drew, if you could continue with addressing uh, wetland regulations 12. Yeah. So not much more to add. There were no, uh, like I said, substantive changes to regulation 12 mitigation. No public comment. Uh, when it was advertised for public comment uh, a few couple of months, about a month or a, and a half ago. Uh, so no changes to the wording at our last meeting under the bylaw review subcommittee. We just went over it once more just to make sure that uh, there weren't any additional uh, feedback or edits. So I recommend that regulation, chapter 132 regulation 12 mitigation be promulgated as worded. Questions from our commissioners? There's no further discussion, and no one here in the public is here to comment. We'll entertain a motion for approval. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we promulgate Chapter 172, Regulation 12, Mitigation as Revised. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Do we hear a second? Second. Thank you, Charlie. Voting. Paul? Yes. Brian? Yes. Tom? No. Charlie? Yes. Alex? Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. So you Thank could... you uh, to Brian, Alex, Brad, and Paul for, for helping out and getting these regulations uh, edited and uh, ready for promulgation. So it takes a lot of time and effort, and I appreciate it. Um, so the last item, uh, sorry, if you, I just wanted to just give some background on one of the COCs. I know they don't normally uh, have discussion, but this one, some issues came up. So for the 618 uh, hearing, this is for the certificate of compliance for 55 Shoestring Bay Road. This was for uh, some uh, additions to the existing home, addition to deck and an existing, uh, addition over an existing deck uh, of the home. Border, uh, buff, uh, bordering top of Coastal Bank, and uh, it was noted by the surveyor of VSS Design when they submitted the COC inspection that there were some uh, observations that they saw that weren't in line with the order conditions or the plan of record. One of them was removal of some trees that I had since spoken with the homeowner, and they had uh, supplied photos that I had been shown a few years back, and it just wasn't, uh, I didn't have any documentation of it, it was kind of a verbal storm damage cleanup approval, so that got straightened out, but there was also um, some grading and hardscaping work, landscape retaining wall, uh, landscape tie retaining wall that was created without a permit a couple of years after the house work uh, additions were done, which was back in 2012, so this work took place in talking with the homeowners around 2014. Um, the issue with it is that it wasn't something that I would say wouldn't have been able to have been permitted had they come to us. Uh, prior to doing the work, but it did extend out into the coastal bank in an area of coastal bank that was already existing law and it was coastal bank by slope definition, not naturally vegetated. Um, so in light of that, uh, this is one of those situations that we encounter quite a bit where somebody, an applicant is coming forward with a certificate of compliance at the 11th hour when they're about to sell, sell the home. Uh, so they're up against a deadline, and um, so I had a conversation with the homeowners on how best to address the issue, and what my suggestion was, was to um, have this work filed before the commission after the fact, notice of intent for this rating and hardscaping, and um, get a cost estimate for everything involved in the cost of permitting, creation of a plan, it's going to trigger mitigation, so the cost of mitigation based on the square footage, which is going to be at a two to one ratio. Uh, and once they figure out all of the uh, estimated costs, the current homeowners will put money into an escrow account for the new homeowners to cover the entire cost of this um, compliance permitting. And uh, we will withhold issuance of the COC, which you'll be signing tonight. I recommended signing it, and you can have a conversation and provide feedback on this, this was just my suggestion to the homeowners, given the, the circumstance, um, that we would sign it, but we would not issue it until we received documentation that this escrow account was created 
and then the surveyor, I had a conversation with them, would get going on the after-the-fact notice of intent filing as soon as they possibly could. This is a solution given the, uh, the circumstances uh, and the pending sale of the home, and it's, it's pretty typical that we encounter this quite a bit. Uh, applicants simply don't read their order of conditions or they assume that their consultant is going to handle everything from A to Z, and who knows what type of conversations take place between the consultants and homeowners. I can only say that the homeowners are ultimately responsible for reading and understanding their order of conditions, and they sign a document attesting to that fact. So, um, but in light of that, it's, it's still a situation that I felt that this was going to be the most uh, efficient and expeditious process to get compliance while not interfering with the sale of the home. Uh, so, and they agree. They, they're going to... Uh, to follow up on that. So, um, does anyone have any questions on that? Or? What would be the time frame, Drew? Something like that to occur. I I only communicated with BSS Design today because they had asked the same thing. They said, "What do you what do you expect for?" I know it's in the timeline. I said, "As soon as feasible." Because yeah. they have a lot of work, obviously, they're dealing with a lot of other projects and clients. And uh, so I said, "That's you know that's what I suggest is getting getting to it as quickly as you can." can't put a certain date on it because I don't know how busy they are. And that would be the new owners that are filing. That would be the new owners that would file. So obviously, but we're not releasing the certificate of compliance. We can get it signed. So there's we're a not lien releasing. on that property. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Until they provide proof that an escrow account has been set up from their counsel, from their lawyer. Yeah. Other questions from our commissioners? All right, this doesn't require a vote, so we can... No, just an update and just to get feedback on that. I've got, I've got a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Do we have a mechanism that would flag uh, an NOI that is kind of outstanding on a project? In other words, they've never got that land cleared, uh, no COC so what, ever yeah. issued? What we did, because like I said, we, we've had this issue <coughs> come up a lot. Yeah, um, and it's still going to happen moving forward, I'm sure. But we did. This was a couple of years ago. We did make a change to our bylaw that requires any new application that comes in. Uh, the first thing that we do is we look to see if there's anything outstanding on the property in our in our records. And if there is, we're not accepting any new applications until any open orders are closed or any outstanding issues are brought into compliance. Um, so you don't, you don't get your project on the agenda until that gets, and, and in some cases it's done, as you've seen, um, in concurrence with a new permit application. And that's your discretion. If you feel you want to have the compliance done first before they come in with a new permit, that's mm -hmm. your discretion. Yeah. But we have been doing that kind of concurrently. So they'll file for like a certificate of compliance along with whatever request they're bringing forward at the same time. But it's allowed us, it's like, it's a really good housekeeping measure to make sure that we you know, catch it before too much time goes by, and then all of a sudden they're at the 11th hour of the sign, they're home, and oh my God, I need this in a week. Yeah. Can you supply me a letter or something? And, and we didn't want to, we were doing that for a while as a courtesy, and then I just didn't feel comfortable continuing that practice, so then we yeah. changed the bylaw. So, there to catch it. Other discussion? Hearing none, Drew, could you return us to the pre-post hearing agenda items? So uh, next item up is um, a vote for our Associate Commissioner Steve Cook, who is with us tonight, to uh, change his status from Associate to Full-Time Commissioner and taking the seat of our recently uh, retired Brad Sweet. Steve, is there anything you'd like to say? Um, no, I've been on the board for a few years now and been um, glad to help out when needed as associate member, but uh, at this point, I uh, feel like uh, um, I need to step up and be a full-time member. I know Drew's uh, asked me a few times and I've denied it <laughs> because of one reason or another, but uh, you know, glad to help out in this board. It's a great board, great town, and you know, glad to help out with the community. So, Thank you, yeah. Steve. Any questions or comments from our board members? Uh, I'll, I would just say that I'm, I'm very happy to see you uh, become a full-time commissioner. As you know, I've been cheerleading you for many months now to, <laughs> to do this, and I'm so, so I'm really glad that you stepped up and uh, decided to take on the full-time, so thank you. Yeah, glad to help out. 
You can take a roll call on this? Yes, so we take a vote of endorsement. All right. There's no further discussion. I would like to motion that we endorse uh, Stephen Cook as a full-time commissioner of the Conservation Commission. Let's I'd go. like to make a motion to accept Steve Cook as a full-time commissioner on the Conservation Commission. How would you make that a second and then we can move forward? <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, I must have missed something. Ah, <laughs> uh, the internet. <laughs> I'll second that. Thank you, Tom. Voting, Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Welcome, Steve. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Golf <laughs> uh, Next up is a vote of um, the request of Marjorie Claprud to join the Conservation Commission as Associate Commissioner. And as you all recall, Marjorie uh, attended the last meeting of the commission to introduce herself. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it tonight, but um, I know you've had some uh, the, the uh, chance to correspond with her at the previous meeting. So with that, I'll open it up for discussion and a motion. I am amazed by this woman's depth of experience. I think she would be an asset to the commission and the town, and um, I fully support her candidacy as an associate commissioner. <laughs> you need a motion. That was a comment. <laughs> oh, it was a motion? No. Oh. Well, you guys have me out to lunch tonight. <laughs> well, we're in the home stretch here, Charlie. Yeah. Is there any discussion? No, it's been a long night. Any further discussion? Um, is, did anyone not get a chance to hear uh, Marjorie's background or resume? Yeah, I didn't, but oh. that's a. That She's pretty impressive. She she yeah. has experience uh, for the state legislature, uh, as a state legislature for a number of years, and she's pretty heavily involved with um, local advocacy groups. And she served on the Bright Coves Village Association for a number of years. So, um, I've I've had the pleasure of meeting her on a few occasions for a variety of projects in New Seabury, and uh, I know she's very passionate about the environment, and she brings a pretty broad wealth of experience uh, to the commission. So. Okay. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. There's no further discussion. I'd like to motion that we approve and recommend Ms. Marjorie Clapperwood uh, and endorse her as an associate uh, commission member. I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Any further discussion? Voting. Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, the meeting minutes of March 24th, 2022. And those in attendance at that meeting <laughs> Brad Sweet, Paul Colombo, Chad Smith, Tom O'Neill, uh, Aaron Copeland, and Charlie Dalt. Is there any discussion on the meeting minutes of 3-24-22? Absent further discussion, we'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to accept the meeting of 3-24-22. Thank you, Charlie. Do I hear a second? I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. I would also ask if the correction on the adjournment vote was made. Katrina, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. So did you make the correction that Paul noted on the uh, adjournment motion? I did. I um, just did it from my work computer, so I printed it out thinking I'd be here in person and then forgot that I had to do it from home tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, so it is done, but if you want to just, uh, you know, make it like a motion with the amendment, um, sure. either way is fine. But it has been corrected. Okay. And if you could just forward that to me through email, and then I can, uh, I I can save it onto our, our files. Yep, I will. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so to confirm that's been included into the record and corrected? Correct. Okay. Yeah. We'll uh, entertain a motion if there's no further discussion. 
we, we had we that. Had a motion. Yeah. We need a second. Paul second it. Thank um, you, Brian. Yes, I second. Yeah. Brian, were you there? Uh, Brian actually needed, was not there. Paul second. Yeah, Brian, you can't second it because you weren't president. No, I didn't second it. Okay. Charlie made the motion and Paul yeah, seconded Paul the second. motion. I seconded it. The thing you're here to say. Yeah. Correction. <laughs> <laughs> now voting. <laughs> Paul. Yes. Tom. Aye. Aaron. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. One last pre-hearing, post-hearing agenda item before we move on to the updates. Um, Are we doing the one for canceling the night? Yes. So I am requesting that the commission um, cancel the June 9th meeting. I'll be on vacation from June 1st to June 8th and uh, won't have enough time to prepare for the CONCOM meeting. And uh, this was really just um, a result of uh, um, Caitlin's uh, resignation date which was uncertain prior to me um, choosing my vacation days. So um, that's why I'm, I'm asking for uh, a request for the commission to cancel the June 9th meeting. Uh, and we will provide waivers of the 21 day statute uh, for scheduling hearings for any applicants um, that we're looking to get onto that meeting date if should you choose to cancel. Don't leave me with just one day to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> Given as much time as the department spent uh, man or woman down, I, I'm sure you're not looking forward to it. <laughs> Questions and discussion from the commissioners? If there's none, we'll entertain a motion. I move we cancel the June 9th, 2022 meeting of the Nashby Conservation Commission. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Voting, Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Enjoy your vacation. Thanks. Well, the last one I'm going to have for a while. Thank you. <laughs> 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 um, so just a few updates here uh, for the commission. Um, Redbrook Road Culvert, the consultant Horsley Witten Group has pretty much wrapped up their data collection. And um, so I'll keep the commission updated as, as that uh, is an ongoing and when they present their conceptual recommendations for Redbrook, um, that flooded bog area and the culvert. Um, as I stated at the last meeting, it had also undergone a phase one inspection. Uh, which deemed it to be a continuing designation as a significant hazard dam. Uh, any questions on that? Upper Quashnet restor Restoration, we were going to have the alternatives, um, presentation of alternatives, conceptual design by Horsey Witten Group tonight, but uh, Horsey Witten had asked for additional time uh, to finalize their presentation, so they'll be coming in on the May 12th meeting to present and that will give uh, more time if anyone hasn't uh, reviewed the conceptual plan. Uh, if you haven't received it, let me know. I'll send it out to you. Uh, there was a link that you have to click open because the attachments file sizes were just too big to send through email. But uh, if anyone has any questions or comments and you want to submit them prior to the meeting, uh, feel free to send them to me via email. Um, we had a mo Reading, meeting of the bylaw review subcommittee uh, on April 26th to discuss the recently promulgated regulations, uh, as well as looking at uh, regulation 30, which was rescinded a few years back, prevention of pollution and nitrogen loading. So we had a good discussion kind of uh, going over the existing language, what we felt uh, may need to be edited. And one of the things that I had recommended, which I have since reached out to uh, Board of Health is for either our May 12th meeting or May 27th, is to have uh, the health agent and the chairman of the Board of Health attend our Conservation Commission meeting. So we can kind of have a discussion back and forth about IE systems, um, how effective they are, learn a little bit more about them, have them weigh in on Regulation 30. Um, and I think it'd just be a benefit uh, moving forward to, uh, to get that regulation finalized and and just uh, as education for myself and the commissioners on IA systems because uh, Brian Baumgartner who's the chairman of the Board of Health he also 
uh, works in the testing uh, field on the base for all of these different technologies. So there's no better person to have uh, give a presentation. So waiting to hear back, and we'll finalize those dates, uh, that date moving forward. Um, we also discussed some uh, feedback from the consultants that were hired by the town for the town's municipal vulnerability preparedness program. This is a consulting firm by the name of Fuss and O'Neill. They're looking at all the town regulations, zoning, um, board of health, and uh, the nitrogen, some of the bylaws under the town, like nitrogen control bylaw, and our own wetland uh, regulations to see where uh, we can make some uh, adjustments, improvements, amendments uh, to strengthen our regulations uh, in the face of um, climate change. And, and that's what really the MVP program is helping to, you know, all towns that qualify for it, uh, for funding, for educational purposes, technical assistance, and monetary financial assistance uh, when it comes to implementing um, various types of improvements, mostly related to stormwater management, but also just overall resiliency in the face of climate change, uh, how municipalities can increase their resiliency through a number of different ways. So this is, uh, so they made some recommendations to a few sets of our regulations. Uh, regulation 25, which deals with the flood zone, 29, buffer zones and buffer strips, and regulation 31, nitrogen loading and lawn standards, as well as a recommendation that we in think about increasing the buffer zone beyond the current 100 foot uh, buffer zone. So all those things were presented and we started an initial discussion and that'll be ongoing with the consultants as we get into uh, other phases of the MVP program. Uh, John's Pond should be scheduling follow-up survey for John's Pond for Milfoil mid-May, and then they're also, the, the company uh, Water and Wetlands will also survey Santua Pond as we detected Milfoil last year, but it was too late in the season to do a full-blown survey. So that will be forthcoming next month. We had the kickoff meeting for the Chop Chick Bogs uh, for phase two with Horsey Witten Group and uh, all of the stakeholders. And phase two is going to involve um, planning from the conceptual uh, phase one stage, which presented a wetland restoration scenario. Um, so phase two is uh, creating 60% uh, plans and then eventually 100% plans in a, uh, to get them ready for permitting. Uh, and there's many levels of permitting that this project has to go through, namely before the commission through a notice of intent, and then water quality certification uh, with the state of Massachusetts, uh, MEPA review, the Mass uh, Environmental Policy Act, MISA review, the Endangered Species Act, um, and just about any other act you can think of. That, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of levels of approval, but it is a restoration project, and I don't anticipate there being any hurdles. It's really just a lot of uh, hoops to jump through uh, to make sure that it's reviewed thoroughly. And so, so that's ongoing, and I'll continue to update everybody on that, as well as the local comprehensive plan. And um, last and certainly not least is uh, the last day for our assistant agent, Caitlin Cattery, is May 13th. And um, I will, would like to do something to give her a nice proper send off um, on her last day. So I'll be sending out information on that. And, uh, hopefully Caitlin's not watching because I want to make it a surprise. So <laughs> I'm sure she's enjoying Alaska and not, not watching this meeting. So. <laughs> Uh, is she yeah. moving on to another job or? Uh, yeah, she's, uh, so she, her boyfriend um, got a job as a policeman in the town of Seward, Alaska, and um, which is near the Kenai Peninsula. That's over uh, the bridge, right? Yeah, it is over the bridge. It's pretty far over the bridge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, she is moving on. But we can yeah. Yeah, communicate with her if you want to. Talk to her more about it. I don't want to, okay. <laughs> since we're on television. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously everybody knows how much Caitlin's going to be missed and um, how much she's done for the department. She really has taken on uh, a lot of roles and followed through on a lot of projects, uh, spent a lot of time volunteering above and beyond the normal hours uh, of the job. So she's going to be tough to replace, certainly miss her, but. Uh, Mostly wish her well in her future. Yeah, she's done well. Yeah. yeah, she really has. Very. Yeah. And that's it. All right, thank you, Drew. Well, is there any other business uh, any commissioner would like to bring before the commission? 
Hearing none, I entertain a motion to adjourn. Hello. Oh, oh. Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, this is Brad Saunders. I was here this evening to talk about the Marshall Valley Trust, uh, Marshall Village Trust request for the extension of the order of conditions. Oh, okay. Was that ever discussed? So it doesn't, extension requests don't usually require uh, discussion. It's really just as long as we receive a, a request for an extension and we know the reasons why, there's usually no discussion involved with extension requests. Oh, I was not informed of that. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. no problem. Appreciate you staying in. Thank you. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> Sorry. I realize. All right, if there's no further business, now we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn at 7.25 p.m. Thank you, Brian. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Oh, that was a tie. We'll go with the vice chairman, <laughs> just because he's sitting here. Voting. Paul. Yes. Brian. Yes. Tom. Aye. Charlie. Yes. Alex. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.